capitalizing on the credit crunch itself, um, we've, 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 we've bought several um, portfolios or individual uh, names of, of debt that's, that's sitting on the balance sheet of the banks. Many of those banks are motivated to sell by either regulatory pressures, capital pressures, or, uh, or to please markets. They don't really think for the most part that selling those assets today is an economically sensible thing to do, but they don't really have any choices. So they're, they're taking some of these big chunks of leveraged loans, most particularly, and dumping it into the market, and a market when there's not much in the way of bu buying appetite. That's created some historic opportunities. If you look back forever, basically, at the trading price of leveraged loans, you'll see they bounce around between 98 and 102% a par. And boom, they've come down into the mid 80s. Uh, this at a, so they're at historic lows for performing leveraged loans. Right. This at a time when high yield spreads are not near their peaks. So high yield markets have held up much better versus their lows than leveraged loans which are making new lows. Similarly, similarly non-performing loans are also uh, priced above their historic uh, uh, levels. Because okay. there's, there's, uh, there's more absolute return capital than there is distressed out there today, which I'm sure you'll ask about later. But that means that if, if you had to pick a place in the credit markets to look for real value in a historical concept, context, it really is in one part of the market. Uh, I'm talking about corporate market now, leveraged loans. Mm -hmm. It's not in high yield, it's not in distressed, uh, and so on. It might also be in resi residential, we think it is, by the way, as a mm -hmm. firm, and our, have, our, our, have set, have are setting up to do that, have a team of, of people we've hired to build up that, and we've put about $2 billion into residential also. But I'm talking about corporate loans now. So we bought a lot of that. That's one thing we're doing. Also, we've, we've kept, also at a time when the credit markets are closed, they're closed to the big buyouts. Um, they've never been completely closed, but they are closed, fun, but practically they're closed to big buyouts. But they're also closed to your run-of-the-mill company that wants to borrow money to go build a new plant, to acquire their competitor, uh, taking advantage of hopefully um, lower equity prices and perhaps uh, a benign uh, antitrust environment that could get worse if we, after the election. Or, and they're closed to companies that want to do a recapitalization uh, create some shareholder value, pay some dividends, because they're, they're worried with their stock down about activist hedge funds. So there are a lot of motivations why medium-sized companies are looking for capital, and they can't raise, and their stocks are down, which is often the motivating, one of the forced sources here, and they can't borrow money or access to high yield market either. Right. So what that's opened up is a whole raft of um, different kind of investing, minority, uh, majority or substantial influential minority, or pipes, structured mm -hmm. deals, uh, where, so they can continue their, their strategic plans. So we're looking at a lot of those. There are also a number of industries where, frankly, all the incumbents have either been neutralized or, 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 or pretty much uh, are, are, are very constrained by their own access to capital and their own legacy problems. And there are great management teams, and with capital, you can, you can reestablish a new company in some of those sectors. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett has obviously done this in, uh, in the uh, monoline uh, right. loan guarantee business. With a management team and capital, you can reestablish a new business, uh, reach uh, critical mass and share very quickly. You've essentially bought in at book value. Right. And then when that company's up and running, and, and environments get a little better, you, presumably you can exit at, a, at, at something over book value. That's an interesting play because right now, for new capital coming in, spreads in some of those businesses are at very, very high levels. So their returns mm -hmm. on equity are above normal. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of an interesting play too. We're, we're looking at several of those. So you're looking to get your return more on the, uh, the fact that values are depressed and perhaps a little less on leverage um, than in the past? Yeah, well, you know, historically, when if you look at where our gains come from, two-thirds of our gains come from the increase of EBITDA mm -hmm. and uh, that, that we drive with our operating people. Um, uh, about, about a quarter of the gains come from multiple expansion, and that multiple expansion just doesn't just happen. We almost always buy companies. We pay, when we buy companies, if they're public companies, we pay a premium, obviously. So we're expecting when we go into a public company to exit at a lower multiple than we enter. However, if we do the right things operationally with a company, 
We have about 26 senior executives that work with our companies. There are operators that are, that are dedicated to Blackstone and to working with our management teams. If those people go in and do a good job, three things happen to the company. It grows faster, it has higher margins, has higher return on capital, and if, and if you accomplish all of those, you actually, when you go back public again or sell it to a strategic investor or even another financial buyer, you sell for a higher multiple than it than was justifiable before. Right. So our ability to drive EBITDA growth also drives higher multiple. Debt pay down and debt accounts for less than 10% of our gains.